Welcome on board the Rich Planet Starship, broadcasting from somewhere high above the Earth. I'm Richard D. Hall. Now, if you're going to attempt to try to understand world power, arguably the most important factor is oil. This week's guest is an oil field executive and is now a pioneer of the world truth movement. He has raised public awareness of corporate globalization, peak oil and Codex Alimentarius, to name just a few. So without further ado, let's activate the teleporter and get him beamed up onto the ship. Ian R. Crane, welcome to the Starship. Well, that was painless. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm well, thank you, Richard. So I said in the introduction there that you're a pioneer of the Tooth Movement, and that's very much how I view you. Um, would you go along with that? Well, it's very kind of you to say so, but um, no, I don't think so. Um, I think probably at best, uh, I would say I'm a, a sort of latter generation. Right. Um, and I think the, uh, the phrase pioneer really needs to be credited to you know, the likes of probably Jordan Maxwell, Tex Mars, mm -hmm. um, David Icke, you right. know, because these are the guys who were right out there at the forefront taking all the arrows in their backs, right. you know. So, but fortunately, of course, I mean, events have, um, have moved on, mm -hmm. and these guys have been proven, in my opinion, mm -hmm. to be uh, pretty much uh, correct in some of their earlier assertions. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's occurring now is that there is a, a mass political awakening, mm -hmm. and uh, I and many, many others are now part of, if you like, the next generation of uh, people who are encouraging others to see what's really going on. Okay. So we come on to the oil industry, Ian. You, you started life in the oil industry. Is that, was that your first job? No, not quite. I actually, um, by original qualification, I'm, uh, my specialization, believe it or not, was military telecommunications. All right. Um, but I uh, didn't spend too long doing that. In fact, uh, no time at all. I, moved, I joined a company called Schlumberger mm -hmm. in uh, 1979, originally in the uh, manufacturing side of the company. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, um, not long after, I moved into the, uh, the oil mm -hmm. field services side. Mm -hmm. And Schlumberger is not a name that rolls off most people's tongue. Mm -hmm. But anybody who's worked in the oil industry or been closely associated with it, with it will know the name Schlumberger. Schlumberger is the largest oil field services company in the world. It's actually, in terms of oil field services, it's uh, larger than Halliburton. Mm. But it's not an American company, it's a, it's a truly transnational company. So it does have the opportunity to sort of work in places right. where Halliburton can't. So how did you, or what led you to leave the oil industry then? Well, if, um, in the first instance, I mean, I need to share an experience with you. I was one of the first civilians to go into Kuwait at the end of the first Gulf War. Right. Myself and a, a few other guys uh, from the oil industry, we went into Kuwait to, uh, to, to basically take a look at the logistical requirements that were going to uh, have to be put into place to deal with the fires that had been set alight. Yeah, all the, I remember that on the news, all these oil wells were you know, smoking, well, on fire, basically. Yeah, it was, I mean, literally, it was like going into uh, Dante's Inferno. I mean, it was horrendous. <laughs> right. I mean, I don't think anything could have prepared me for, yeah. you know, that experience. But, and of course, you will remember that the reason those fires supposedly were burning mm -hmm. was because the retreating Iraqi troops had set them alight. Yep. But driving around the southern uh, oil fields with our military escort, but it became very obvious to me that the official version of events was not supported by the physical evidence that I was witnessing firsthand. And that physical evidence was the phenomenal level of dead Iraqi troops mm -hmm. lying basically around the wells. And it looked to me like they had been defending the wells, not setting them alight. Mm -hmm. So I happened to make this uh, observation to you know, the uh, military escort that we had. Mm -hmm. They didn't say very much. But a couple of days later, I was sitting down with my colleagues in the, uh, the mess hall of uh, the Kuwaiti oil company in Al-Khamadi in Kuwait. And this 300-pound gorilla in um, U.S. battle fatigues made a beeline for me. And he right. walked straight over and he said, Yuri and Crane? And I didn't even get a chance to answer. He said, I've been hearing you've been cast in some aspersion about who set them wells alight. And I still didn't say anything. And he said, boy, he said, that's the kind of thinking that can get you into a whole lot of trouble. Really? Anyway, yeah, I was just sort of you know, gobsmacked. Right. But he turned around, walked away, leaned over his shoulder, and he said, what the hell's the matter, Ian? Aren't we paying you enough? Right. 
Well, to be honest, although here I am 19 years later, uh -huh. um, glibly telling you the story, I was absolutely crapping myself <laughs> um, because I thought, you know, oh, God, what have I done here? What yeah. have I said? You know, these guys have obviously lied to the world mm -hmm. about what, um, uh, what, happened. what has happened mm -hmm. here. You know, I mean, if, they can, if they're concerned that somebody's going to blow the whistle. Mm -hmm. And I really was, I really was um, very worried. I mean, it, up until... I actually landed back in Dubai where I was based. I mean, all the way through, I was just concerned that uh, something you know, was going to occur. So I didn't really um, worry about it in the short term. I got on with the job. And, but as time wore on and I learned more and more, of course, I, I, was, I was already aware that um, April Glaspie had effectively given, uh, she was the uh, US ambassador to Iraq, and that mm -hmm. she had effectively given Saddam the green light to, erade, uh, to um, invade. Mm -hmm. Kuwait, and uh, and so and as I sort of learned more and more mm -hmm. from information that wasn't available in the public domain, mm -hmm. then obviously I became more and more concerned about the version of reality or version mm -hmm. of history in particular that uh, uh, I thought was um, mm -hmm. orthodox. And so over a period of years, I began to question more and more. And to be frank, by the by five six years later, 1996, 97, I was. Um, and funnily enough, I was about 40. So just at that time when you start right. to question everything in your life anyway. Yes. But that was the point at which I made the decision to get out of the oil industry. All right. Now we come on to the term peak oil. I'm intrigued by this, Ian, because you, you promote this a lot. What does that term mean, peak oil? Well, the, the term peak oil was, was effectively coined way back in the 1950s by a guy called um, Marion King Hubbard. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't like being called Marion, so he had everybody calling him King. But he gave a presentation in 1957 to the Society of Petroleum Engineers in uh, Texas. Mm -hmm. And in that presentation, he presented the hypothesis that by the 1970s, America would no longer be self-sufficient in oil and it would need to import oil. Mm -hmm. Well, after that presentation, he was immediately invited to mm -hmm. become a member of the Club of Rome. Mm -hmm. And uh, funnily enough, his prophecy appears to have come about because in the 1970s, America started importing oil on a massive scale. In fact, the trigger point was 1973, which was, of course, the second of the Arab-Israel wars. Mm -hmm. um, but Henry Kissinger mm -hmm. used that opportunity to hike the price of oil by 400%. Mm -hmm. And this was a deliberate ploy to establish a global economy based on the petrodollar. Right. Now, he was able to do this because a couple of years previously, on August the 15th, 1971, President Nixon had removed the US dollar from the gold standard. Right. Now, if you want to create a global economy, uh -huh. what you've got to do is you've got to make sure that the people around the world have got the money to spend on your products. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem was that the US had products it wanted to sell, arms, Mm -hmm. But the other countries didn't really have the money. Mm -hmm. So Kissinger and James Baker III came up with this brilliant idea. And they said, well, look, you know, we actually need oil. We're, uh, uh, we, yeah, we've got all the oil we need. But mm -hmm. instead of using our own oil, mm -hmm. let's start importing oil. Mm -hmm. Because that way we can actually get money into the global economy. And then those people will spend it with us. Right. So the only country they don't do that with is Israel, because Israel has nothing the U.S. wants. So the U.S. gives Israel $3.6 billion a year. Mm -hmm. But for all the other countries, it, it actually puts money into the global so, economy uh, by buying oil. America could have been self-sufficient if it had wanted to uh, with oil. Absolutely. So they, they have reserves that they would not admit to, then, you think? They have massive reserves. Right. Uh, absolutely massive reserves. But, I mean, it, it's almost an academic point, mm -hmm. you know, because had America been just using its own oil, uh -huh. then we would not have had the, uh, the, the massive growth in consumerist materialism right. that we've seen um, over the last few years. And of course, neither would we have seen, by the way, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the massive growth of a debt-based economy, right. uh, which is effectively what has led us into the financial and economic mire that we see around the world today. So, so Peak Oil is saying that the rate at which um, we are using oil is faster than the rate at which we're discovering it. Therefore, at some point, there will be none left. That's well, the basic principle. That was the hypothesis. And that, that was you would say that's completely and utterly flawed. Absolutely. And it was accelerated again. The, the, um, the whole hypothesis of Peak Oil was reignited in the mid-90s by an Irish um, 
consultant to the mm -hmm. oil industry by the name of Colin Campbell. Now, Colin was uh, uh, coming up to the age of retirement, and um, obviously something sort of kicked in his consciousness. Mm -hmm. And he decided to, uh, say, effectively um, drag the Marion King Hubbard hypothesis out of retirement mm -hmm. and presented this on a global basis. Now, at the time in 1996, some of the observations that he made were actually quite pertinent. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was absolutely right in what he said in that we were using oil faster than we were discovering it. Mm -hmm. But that's a flawed statement because to, f to find something, you've actually got to look for it. Yeah. And what had happened is that uh, through the, the 60s, 70s and early 80s, there'd been so many massive discoveries that basically the oil industry uh, decided that you know, really it didn't need mm -hmm. to uh, continue investing massive amounts of money in exploration mm -hmm. because we already had access to all the oil we were going to need for the next you know, century or so. But the reality is that the growth of um, uh, the developing economies, particularly India and, and China, uh, certainly accelerated the demand beyond what had been initially anticipated. Right. But uh, so, and what you also need to take into account is that um, such was the concern that we we're running out of oil. Oil was actually $9.81 a barrel in 1999, right. which is too low. Right. I mean, it is too low a price. And consequently, the oil industry couldn't actually afford to um, uh, reinvest and replace the infrastructure. Right. So what happened is, um, in, uh, after 9-11, um, and with the invasion of uh, Kuwait, and by the way, a big part of the invasion of, of Kuwait was to stop Saddam put it, pushing his oil out into the open market at mm -hmm. lower prices because mm -hmm. it's very important for the Americans to keep the oil price high. Mm -hmm. So the, with Colin Campbell's help and the, another guy called Matthew Simmons and a few other fringe players, uh, Mike Rupert came into the equation, the whole theory of peak oil and that we were going to run out anytime soon c was pushed back into the uh, public consciousness. Mm -hmm. But what's happened in the last sort of few years is as the price of oil was pushed up and up and up, and of course it peaked in July of 2008, $147 a barrel, mm -hmm. at the point at which the whole market crashed basically, mm -hmm. um, and oil dropped from $147 in July of 2008, and it fell right back down to $35 mm -hmm. in November, and now it holds at around about 75 but um, uh, what was happening was all of this extra money was actually providing the oil companies with the money they needed, one, to reinvest in infrastructure, mm -hmm. but more importantly, to reinvest in exploration. And in the ensuing years, I mean, we have now discovered enough oil. Mm -hmm. f you know, we don't have to really worry too much right. about where the oil is coming from probably for the next hundred years or so. Mm -hmm. But let me add the rider. I am not for one moment suggesting that we should be continuing to build a hydrocarbon-based economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's not healthy for the world, yes. it's, and it's not healthy for the, the, the global population, mm -hmm. it's not healthy for the global economy. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be using oil anyway in the, uh, the levels that we are, but we've also got access to very viable alternatives, but they're all suppressed by the oil industry. Absolutely. Now, now you mentioned uh, um, about the, the peak oil sort of scam and the fact that America didn't bother or had a strategy not to exploit its own oil reserves so that it could create a global economy. I'm trying to get my head around that. Now, I have heard that the reason for the Gulf War, the second Gulf War, is because Saddam Hussein was going to stop trading his oil in dollars. Oh, no. Well, it, um, not, not was planning to, did. Right. He, um, in fact, the moment... So how would that affect their, America's plan for the global economy if he decides... Oh, well, I can tell you. I can tell you exactly what happened. Um, the moment that uh, George W. Bush won the... 2001 election. Mm -hmm. So on, um, on no, in November of uh, 2000, mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein, because obviously he was still mm -hmm. pretty annoyed mm -hmm. at uh, George Bush Sr.'s mm -hmm. um, uh, duplicity, yes. because Saddam believed that as an ally of mm -hmm. the U.S., because bear in mind that the U.S. had been providing Saddam with all the weaponry mm -hmm. during the Iran-Iraq war. Mm -hmm. Of course, we, are, we now know that the U.S. was also providing Iran Mm -hmm. uh, via Oliver North and the Iraq-Contra mm -hmm. um, um, affair. But Saddam believed that he was a, an ally of the US. Mm -hmm. And so when he was given the green light by April Glaspy to invade Kuwait, and then, of course, uh, George Bush Sr. turned on him mm -hmm. and effectively you know, evicted him and then obviously manipulated sanctions against 
Iraq for the next uh, um, decade. Mm -hmm. So Saddam was not best pleased. So he took the opportunity to um, get some retribution right. by at the very moment that it was announced that George uh, w bush had won the 2000 election he immediately stopped trading his oil in us dollars and began trading his oil in euros mm -hmm. now even though he was restricted mm -hmm. in the oil that he could sell because he was only allowed to sell on the sort of oil for food program but nonetheless that amount of oil trading in euros rather than us dollars caused the us dollar to fall by 20 percent against the basket of international currencies. Right. Now, you remember, of course, on, I think it was May the 5th of um, 2003, mm -hmm. George Bush flew onto the USS Lincoln mm -hmm. in flights, very, very dramatic, and on the back where he gave the speech mm -hmm. that uh, hostilities had ended in Mission Iraq. accomplished. Mission accomplished. Yeah. Mission accomplished. And, of course, your average viewer thought what that meant was mission accomplished, we've effectively invaded Iraq, we're at Baghdad, Saddam yeah. is out of power. Not at all. What that statement was, it was a statement to the financial community saying that from this moment forward, Iraqi oil is now trading once again in US dollars. All right, and uh, Ian... Okay, you heard it here, and we're going to go for a short break now, and we're going to talk more about how um, oil plays its role in world control. Um, don't go away. Welcome back on board the Starship. I'm talking with Ian R. Crane. Now, we've been discussing the oil industry, and off camera we had a little discussion there because I was trying to get my brain around it, and essentially America... The reason why it hasn't exploited its own oil reserves is because if it can get the rest of the world to do it by using economic manipulation, it, it, is, it is enslaving those people to do its work for it. And this is why it hasn't um, exploited its own oil reserves. It seems a bit bizarre, but you say that this is the, the con or this is the trick that most people don't see. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And you see, I mean, the, the key point is that the only way in which the U.S. can make sure that um, it's selling its armaments overseas mm -hmm. uh, rather than giving them away mm -hmm. is to make sure that these other countries have money. Mm -hmm. And so the re way in which it makes sure they have money is to buy their oil. Mm -hmm. So they're busy spending all of their effort digging this black stuff out of the ground and then that goes over to America and it enables them to get, have something to put their effort into, I suppose. Exactly. Right. Now, um, the Russians are known to have uh, dug hundreds of very, very deep wells. I mean, I think some of them go down as far as five mile, I believe. Now, tell us about these deep wells, Ian, because I don't think there are many Western companies that have done this. Am I right in that? You're Is absolutely it? right. And, and I can't tell you as much as I, perhaps I might like because I don't know. Right. Um, the Russians have kept this technology very, very close to, to their chest. Mm -hmm. One of the important things to uh, acknowledge here is that the Russians have a very different philosophy mm -hmm. in terms of the origins of oil. Mm -hmm. And you know, some people might say, hang on, origins of oil and philosophy, we know what the origins of oil mm -hmm. is. No, we don't. Mm -hmm. Any self-respecting geologist who is genuinely intellectually curious will acknowledge that we do not truly know the origins of oil. We are told, mm -hmm. we are told in the West the oil is a fossil fuel, and this term is sort of thrust down our throats. So fossil trees fuel. and vegetation, etc., dies and it gets compressed, and then it creates coal and, and oil and gas, I guess, as well. And we then come along millions of years later and dig it out of the ground. So, but there's another theory, isn't there, Ian? There is another theory, uh, and the, the hypothesis that has been put forward ostensibly from within the old Soviet Union. In mm -hmm. fact, um, I would encourage people, as always, to uh, you know, go take a look at this for themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, we live in a wonderful age when people don't have to take anything at face value. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the establishment demands that they do take things at face value, mm -hmm. and they don't like it when people you know, actually take the initiative and do their own research, mm -hmm. because they might actually uncover the fact that orthodox reality doesn't actually often stack up. Mm -hmm. And the, the Russian hypothesis is that oil is a naturally occurring fluid mm -hmm. that originates deep from within the bowels of the earth. Mm -hmm. How it's formed, 
etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is very much um, mm -hmm. open to further mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. I mean, the hypothesis has been put forward that it's the Earth's blood, that it's the lubricant for mm -hmm. the tectonic plates, you know, whatever. But it comes up, or their hypothesis is, that it comes from reservoirs deep, deep, deep in the earth mm -hmm. and works its way up through a series of reservoirs. Mm -hmm. Now, oil has been effectively gifted, if you like, to mm -hmm. humanity um, for millennia. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that oil has, uh, in a number of places on the earth, just seeped out the ground. And, and people for you know, many um, thousands of years have used it for oil lamps or for caulking boats. Mm -hmm. It's only in the last 130 years, of course, or 140 years, that we've actually started to require more than just seeps out through the surface of the, the planet mm -hmm. and started to um, uh, explore mm -hmm. it underground. And of course that started with the drilling back in the, uh, the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. And initially, of course, we were just tapping into the reservoirs that were fairly close to the surface. Mm -hmm. But as time has gone on and, and demand has increased, um, then yeah, we've had to go deeper and deeper. And this is now what you'll hear the, the uh, proponents of peak oil saying, mm -hmm. is they're saying, oh, actually, we weren't talking about the fact that we were going to run out of oil. What we were talking about was the fact that we're running out of the easy oil. Mm -hmm. Well, that's mm -hmm. true. That's right. true. You know, hey, technology advances. And yeah. Um, yeah, actually, even the more difficult oil mm -hmm. to get at is becoming cheaper to, uh, um, to extract as mm -hmm. the technology uh, enhances. But the Russians have been drilling deep wells for probably 30, 40 years. And they've kept the technology very, very close to their chest. In fact, they have a whole different philosophy of exploration as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is one of the reasons that we should actually sort of take note because Russia, without any question today, is the world's largest producer of mm -hmm. oil. And this will be referred to as abiotic oil? Is that the word you would use? That's the, that's the phrase that is, is used. I mean, so the... the it, would it not be simple, Ian, to prove whether that oil originates from a fossil or, or not? Or is it not that no, simple? No, it's not that simple right. at all. I mean, you know, hey, listen, uh, you know, some hydrocarbons may come by the means of, yeah. um, you know, the, the, the compacting uh -huh. over time yes. of... Uh, of I um, mean, five through. miles deep it is quite... It, difficult to think. It's well, a shed load of dinosaurs, isn't yeah, it? it is. <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and apparently I, I've heard that w when these wells are drilled and, and oil is released, they, they seem to f fill up and self-replenish. Well, again, this is, I mean, it's a very good observation you make there because the uh, Russians, again, use um, a reservoir management technique that is not applied in the West. And that technique is they treat an oil well like a farmer treats a field. Right. In other words, you don't just keep planting crop year after year after year, sucking all the nutrients and goodness out of the soil. You, you rotate your crops mm -hmm. and then you leave it to lie in fallow for a period, however right. long that might be. Mm. And, and the Russians have been doing that with oil wells and right. gas wells for you know, some years. Mm -hmm. What they'll do is they'll monitor the pressure, the natural pressure with which the, uh, the oil or gas is coming to the surface. And as the pressure starts to fall, they will make a value judgment based on their experience, at which point they'll shut the well. Mm -hmm. They'll shut that well down and then go, mm -hmm. you know, extract it somewhere else. And then what they do is over time, they'll monitor the, uh, the pressure of that reservoir. And in many cases, the, um, the original pressure mm -hmm. is, uh, is naturally replenished, regenerated, right? replenished and yeah. regenerated. And then they'll go back to that well and tap it again. So let's just come on to the, um, we've mentioned how America have manipulated the, the oil and, and, you know, people say that there are certain families who are the New World Order or, you know, the Illuminati. H how do they fit into this, Ian? I mean, mm -hmm. is it true that there are 13 bloodlines or families that are controlling this cabal? I mean, how does that fit into the, the control of oil? Well, I, I mean, obviously, what we have is the, the Rockefellers. I mean, you don't get away from the fact that the Rockefellers are right there. I mean, that right. was standard oil. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 I mean, that, that family still obviously has a very significant oil interest today. Right. But, you know, let's go back a little bit. Uh, is it the Illuminati? You will never hear me in my presentations refer to the Illuminati because right. I believe that's a misnomer. Right. Um, and so, unfortunately, for a lot of people, I use a much longer... Uh, phrase, right. but it, it's much more specific. Mm -hmm. I talk about those who believe themselves to be the rightful rulers of a planetary fiefdom. 
It's a very small number of people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who probably would consider themselves to be Illuminati mm -hmm. are actually nothing but puppets. Right, so a very small number. I mean, can you name them? Would you say Henry Kissinger? Would you say... Uh, I mean, look, so many um, of these guys are, are very, very close to the inner sanctum. Right. But um, is Henry Kissinger one of the inner, inner sanctum? I don't think so. Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski are arch strategists. They are brilliant at what they do. Mm -hmm. And they are employed effectively by those who believe themselves to be the rightful rulers mm -hmm. to carry out this strategy. Mm -hmm. And these guys, it's like Tony Blair. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tony Blair displays all of the clinical behaviors of a socio-psychopath. Mm -hmm. And as does Kissinger, as does Brzezinski. In other words, they think nothing of instigating events that will cause death and destruction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A human mm -hmm. who has the benefit of inherent love and compassion mm -hmm. and, and the need to cooperate mm -hmm. with a fellow man could not do this. Mm -hmm. So the socio-psychopaths are identified at a very early age in, in, I mean, in academia, mm -hmm. and they're selected for the fraternities that mm -hmm. we know are very dominant, like Skull and Bones, like Phi Beta Kappa, mm -hmm. um, and even through the, uh, the Freemasonry mm -hmm. structure in the US, in, they become Shriners. And so we have this sort of hidden hierarchy, right. which is carrying out the work, mm -hmm. if you like, of, of those, that inner sanctum. Right. And that inner sanctum, I mean, John Coleman, in his research, John Coleman wrote a book in the mid-1980s called The Committee of 300. Mm -hmm. And John Coleman acknowledged that even within the Committee of 300, there's an inner, inner sanctum right. who call themselves the Olympians. Right. So 300, I mean, how many of them would be Bilderbergers, would you say? Because of, of the, there are, I mean, there are, well, I don't know how many Bilderbergers there are in total, but each year there's about 140, but it's different people. It's different year. people, yeah. No, the Bilderberger so, meetings mm -hmm. um, are used to ensure that the main players in the political and industrial military mm -hmm. arenas are briefed mm -hmm. on what the agenda is going to be right and to make sure that they understand that their role is to do whatever right. it takes to carry out you know primarily uh this agenda and then in the u.s of course you have the council on foreign relations which mm -hmm. has some you know three plus thousand members mm -hmm. and i mean we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, bp mm -hmm. incident mm -hmm. i think in the third part of the show yes. uh, and we're if hopefully we can uh, mention what happens when a member of the Council on Foreign Relations goes rogue and starts blowing the whistle because mm -hmm. these guys are not best pleased. Mm -hmm. So the, um, within the, uh, the hierarchy, like mm -hmm. the hidden hierarchy, mm -hmm. there's no question there are key groups mm -hmm. which don't have necessarily a formal membership, mm -hmm. but people are invited to these meetings. Mm -hmm. And if you are invited to these meetings and you attend these, these meetings, it is the same as being initiated into a fraternity. You are expected to abide by the rules, which means that you will use your position, mm -hmm. whether that's political or within the, uh, in the corporate arena, mm -hmm. to pursue the agenda that's being spelled out by the Bilderbergers, by the leadership of the Council on Foreign Relations, mm -hmm. the Trilateral Commission, etc. We've got people like David Rockefeller and, and, and we mentioned Kissinger. I mean, they're getting on now, aren't they? I mean, are they not younger people who are really taking their reins off them? Oh, for sure. They're just not in the, um, in the public eye. People, you might not even know who they exactly. are. Exactly. Clearly, they must, these people, if they are um, you know, running our governments or influencing our governments, they must also have their finger in the pie of the central banks. So they, oh. is, I mean, is it... It's inextricably in, interlinked. In, in, inextricably interlinked. And, and, and I think you have to dis differentiate between central banks and high street banks because I think a lot of people, they don't even understand that the central banks are what make our money. They create the money out of thin air and loan it to governments and they loan it to our high street banks. High street bank. banks, exactly. So they have the ultimate power with, with regards to controlling a currency. So can you speak about that, Ian? Just, just yeah. Well, what they've done is, I mean, and literally in the space of 40 years, I mean, we can actually pinpoint the real key points in the breakdown of the global economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it starts obviously in 1913 with the establishment of the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, let's accelerate uh, forward because, first of all, the British Empire is um, if effectively neutered mm -hmm. by the Second World War. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, part of the agreement was 
with the loans that were acquired from the USA, mm -hmm. ostensibly, but mm -hmm. from the central banks, mm -hmm. part of the agreement was not just to pay back the loans, but some of the loan or some of the interest would mm -hmm. be uh, wiped out, provided the UK agreed to effectively dismantle its empire. Mm -hmm. And of course, we, we saw that systematically occur between 1947 and basically Hong Kong, really, mm -hmm. was the last one in the late 1990s. Um, but the, the, the central banks, yes, they effectively establish how much liquidity, if mm -hmm. you like, mm -hmm. there is in the global markets. And what's happened to, to create this uh, um, uh, outrageous consumerist materialistic market, mm -hmm. they have established out, an outrageous level of fractional reserve banking, mm -hmm. i.e. creating money out of, out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And just to put it in perspective, the total debt of the USA, mm -hmm. coupled with the total debt of just the UK mm -hmm. right now, those two countries alone, let alone everybody else, mm -hmm. and we know Iceland has mm -hmm. gone bankrupt, we know Greece is in a world of hurt, Italy's in a world of hurt, Spain, mm -hmm. Portugal, well, the UK is actually also in a world of hurt, but mm -hmm. the combined debt of the US and the UK is greater than the total amount of currency in the world today. Right, I mean, it's, it just sounds preposterous, doesn't of it? Of course it is. I mean, really, they're leveraging this debt to enslave the world, essentially. Look, they're getting people... In, the whole nature of the game is to get people into debt. Mm -hmm. You know, the word mortgage, mortgage, means death grip. Mm -hmm. uh, once you've got individuals in debt, you've got them where you want them. Mm -hmm. And actually, what they've been trying to do over the last few years and will continue to try to do, and actually, unfortunately, quite successfully, mm -hmm. and until such time as there is total collapse, is to neuter the middle classes, because what they're effectively trying to do is make sure that uh, nobody really has financial independence, because mm -hmm. if they don't have fin financial independence, then they are a slave. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, what we're seeing is more and more people, we've seen in the last few years, more and more people go into negative equity on their, mm -hmm. on their mortgages. We've seen people being encouraged to borrow outrageous sums of money against their, their, their property. Yeah. Um, and then the property markets deliberately crashed so that they're in negative mm -hmm. equity got them by the... I mean, one thing that, that we never hear people say on the mainstream about this, and it's quite a simple concept to understand, that, that a government which has its own sovereign currency, by definition, should never be in debt. Be and, and because it can print the money... No, you are right. But, you are right. but there are a very, very few countries in the world mm -hmm. that actually have the capability to produce sovereign currency. Mm -hmm. And every one of those countries is a classified by George Bush mm -hmm. and co. as the axis of evil. The common denominator between Iran, Korea, North Korea, Cuba, Libya, mm -hmm. the common denominator with all these countries is that, and, and Venezuela of course, is that they are not in debt to the World Bank. They are totally in control of their sovereign economy. Right. And the World Bank's objective is to break that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why um, you know, the likes of uh, Ahmadinejad, Mm -hmm. um, uh, North Korea, uh, Chavez in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. I mean, Gaddafi has actually sort of suckered up to them a little bit and said, well, look, okay, I'll take a little bit of debt. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a, an example of how a country is bought under the cosh of mm -hmm. the World Bank is Dubai. Mm -hmm. You know, here, here was a country that should have been totally self-sufficient because it had the uh, natural resources. Yeah. And, and Sheikh Mohammed Al Maktoum was actually trying to develop a diversified economy. He built a, you know, a massive aluminium smelting plant. Mm -hmm. He was producing power plants, power plants, desal desal desalination, plants, yeah. you know, golf finance. Yeah. I mean, it was a, a um, balanced economy. The World Bank came along and said, "Hey, you know, we've got a great idea. How about you build some islands off the coast of uh, Dubai in the shape of a palm tree, yeah. so big you'll be able to see it from." Yeah out of space, and, and just for good measure, you can build a few more islands in the shape of the world. And again, you'll be able to see it from out of space. You'll be able to leave your mark on the planet. Mm -hmm. And Sheikh Mohammed Al Maktoum said, well, you know, it's an interesting idea, but, you know, it uh, stretches my financial resources perhaps a little bit further than I might like. And they said, no, 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 no worry. No worry, we'll lend you the money. Yeah. And look at the return you're going to get, because, you know, once you've built these islands, we can put massive villas on them, and you can sell them to all those footballers in the UK who... Yeah. Well, the ones that got any money left after their divorces. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but anyway, so, just as they're about to, he yeah. builds the islands because on money borrowed from the World Bank. Yeah. And, and just as he's about to start to yield a return by selling the islands, boom, pull the rug out from under the economy and he's in the hock to the World Bank. The right. World Bank now own the Dubai Natural Resources. Right, right. Yeah, I've been there. It is a, it's a strange place, Dubai. I mean, I don't particularly like it. It's monstrous, in my oh, opinion. Well, I, I lived there in the, in, uh, from 19, beginning in 1991 until uh, 1993. Yeah. And, I mean, it was very different back then. Right. You know, and, and actually, it was a very enjoyable time. But you're right, today it's very different. All right. Well, uh, we're going to go for another break, Ian. And, okay. and after the break, we're going to discuss the Gulf oil disaster. Welcome back on board the Starship. I'm talking with Ian R. Crane, and we've been talking about oil and, it, and how oil is used in, to control the world effectively. And um, I'm just looking at a few DVDs of Ian's. One of them is called Peak Oil, and this goes into detail of what we've been talking about, basically. Uh, and the second one is um, Population Reduction and the End of an Age. And this DVD, I believe, Ian, you, you actually go into the, the Gulf Oil disaster which we're now we're now going to talk about people exactly. can, can get these dvds from ianrcrane.co.uk so we come on to the the gulf ian you've obviously with your knowledge of the oil industry you're well placed to comment on it uh, i mean f from my perspective what i've seen is the fact that there appears to be obfuscation going on the media are being kept away or they're being told lies uh, so there's a bit of mystery as to what really has gone on so can you give us your perspective on it, Ian, as an ex-oil field man? Okay. Um, let, me, let me go right to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. I absolutely believe that this was a contrived event. Okay, now that wasn't a conclusion that I came to quickly. In fact... So let me just interrupt you there, Ian. So you think this, this Gulf, Mexi Gulf of Mexico oil thing was started deliberately. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. Right. But that, I mean, I, I didn't uh, you know, wake up on the morning of April 21st and see it, it and yeah. say it was a contrived event. In fact, quite the opposite. The irony is, on April the 19th, I was sitting stranded in a hotel in Lisbon Mm -hmm. uh, on my way back from Mozambique. And the reason I couldn't get from Lisbon to Heathrow was because there was an Icelandic volcano that was supposedly putting out an ash cloud yeah. that was covering the whole of uh, Northern Europe, and so all flights were grounded. Mm -hmm. Well, April the 19th is indelibly printed on my brain because that is the day of the um, ATF attack on the Waco compound, mm -hmm. which resulted, of course, in uh, some 72 or people being killed, many of them children. Mm -hmm. Two years later, it was the Alfred P. Murrah uh, building that was bombed in Oklahoma City, allegedly by the lone gunman, Timothy McVeigh. Mm -hmm. um, a few years later, on uh, April the 20th, mm -hmm. um, I think in 2001, mm -hmm. we had the Columbine High School massacre. Mm -hmm. And just from my research um, on these events and others, and because of my research into deep geopolitics and the belief system of those who believe themselves to be the rightful rulers of mm -hmm. the planet, I knew that April the 19th stroke 20th was very significant for them because it's for these guys, it is the day of sacrifice by fire. Mm -hmm. It is the start of the 12 day festival in the run up to Beltane. And there I was sitting in Mozambique, uh, sitting in Lisbon rather, mm -hmm. sorry, um, thinking, my God, you know, this volcano is the precursor to something. Something very significant is going to happen. And I put out a newsletter that night. I sent it out on the night of April the 19th mm -hmm to uh, my readership and basically said, look guys, be vigilant because you know, I don't think the volcano is everything that's going to occur. So you think that was induced by some kind of w space weapon or something? Uh, like I mean, that? I'm going to remain agnostic on that. I just don't know. Right, I okay. just don't know. Um, so it is strange how they got all upset about the Icelandic economy and how they weren't playing ball. And, and then the next minute they have a massive volcano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's easy to go down that line, but as you say, there's no real hard evidence. There's no there. hard evidence. So, so I keep an open mind. Right. But, uh, you know, the following day, um, I, when I woke up, um, obviously on the 20th, mm -hmm. I, I woke up and nothing happened. <laughs> but on the 21st, mm -hmm. when I woke up, I woke up to a whole bunch of emails from people saying, Ian, is this it? Is this Gulf of Mexico rig right. explosion? Is this the event you were talking about? Mm -hmm. And my immediate reaction was, well, I'm not sure, because being from an oil industry background, mm -hmm. I actually found it very difficult to believe that any of my former colleagues in the oil industry could ever have been party to something of this ilk. 
And I even spoke at a, a conference in the United States on deep geopolitics in Santa Cruz, California in the middle of May. Mm -hmm. And even at that conference, I still resisted saying that it was anything other than a series of unfortunate uh, incidents that led to the blowout because I hadn't got enough evidence at the time to mm -hmm. convince me that it was a contrived event. Mm -hmm. But by a couple of weeks later, by the end of May, mm -hmm. uh, I'd reached the conclusion mm -hmm. that not only was this a, a contrived event, but I actually was starting to focus in on the individual who was on the rig who managed to ensure that this accident happened. And in my DVD, I actually name that individual. Yeah. I name that person. I explain the very strange circumstances as to how he came to be on the rig mm -hmm. and then assert himself within some very fundamental decision making, mm -hmm. which actually led to the well effectively um, uh, blowing out, obviously, mm -hmm. and leading to the disaster that we've seen. Now, you're absolutely right in your opening remark about the obfuscation. I mean, this has been mm -hmm. a classic case of uh, BP and the federal government lying mm -hmm. to the world mm -hmm. and, and not least the people around the Gulf. And of course, many people around the Gulf are, uh, have some very recent experience, the US government lying about what's, what's occurring because of the Katrina experience in New Orleans in 2005. And, and in the British media, you could be forgiven for thinking that um, you know, there's no event, there's nothing happening because the British media are hardly covering it. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, even the Daily Mail on um, uh, August the 6th ran a double page spread making the observation that this was a total exaggeration by the US. It was a demonization of BP, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, there was absolutely no oil to be seen anywhere around the Gulf. And this is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, I use today in my presentations that I'm giving um, on this uh, event, um, I always incorporate the most recent footage that I'm sent from the Gulf Coast area. Mm -hmm. And there is oil everywhere. Right. You know, and, and what's happened is that it's not just oil that's the problem, but it's the dispersant that's been poured on the top of it, a, a very, very toxic chemical called Corexit. Mm -hmm. 9500, and then even more toxic version called Corexit 9527A. And what these dispersants do is they effectively break the oil up, mm -hmm. but they, they, what they leave is, uh, if you like, a plume mm -hmm. that's even more toxic than the oil would be if it was just right. left on its own. And it forces it back underwater. Mm -hmm. So now we're, getting the, we're already starting to get the reports of a number of um, things occurring because of BP and the government's, federal government's actions in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. In the first instance, the sea life, Mm -hmm. is, uh, is suffering dramatically mm -hmm. because what this plume is doing is it's effectively creating a block to the sunlight. Right. So natural sunlight is not percolating down through into the depths. So everything below the oil plume is dying. F some fishing waters have been opened in the Gulf. Now 60% of all seafood sold in the US comes from the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and even though the um, Food and Drug Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency have declared some areas of the Gulf open for fishing, mm -hmm. the fishermen themselves are actually having you know, uh, the appropriate attacks of conscience and saying, you know, we're just not, gonna, we're yeah. just not going to fish these grounds mm -hmm. because the, it's not been tested mm -hmm. and we cannot guarantee that the fish isn't toxic. Right. So we know that Oil is toxic at 11 parts per million. Corexit is toxic at 1.2 parts per million. Right. So we've got um, people going swimming mm -hmm. in the sea and even people just breathing the air are reporting sick. Right. We're getting reports of people, um, the symptom, by the way, the first symptom that you're really under attack from this stuff is that you start bleeding out of your butt. Mm -hmm. because the uh, Corexit attacks the red blood corpuscles and then starts to attack right. the organs. And, and then one of the other manifestations is, um, is an outbreak of lesions right. on the skin. Well, if we just go back to, the, to this guy uh, on the rig, I mean, where have you got that information from, just to challenge you on that, Ian? I mean, and is, it a, is it quite a complicated story as to why you've come to this conclusion? Well, not really. I can be brief. I mean, look, every rig in the world operates in the same way, right. um, fundamentally, uh -huh. and it has to, because the oil community, the oil industry community, is an itinerant community. Mm -hmm. And there are three major languages of the oil field, right? Mm -hmm. English, mm -hmm. Spanish, and French. Right. So it's English uh, around the majority of the world, Spanish in uh, Latin America, mm -hmm. and French down the west coast of Africa. Right. So you have to be fluent 
in whatever the language of the rig is. Mm -hmm. So the reason that the hierarchy um, is, is the same is so that an individual can literally go from one rig to another rig. If he's got a particular job to do, he knows exactly what's required of him. He knows who he reports to. He knows who the people he works with is. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's standard. The main decision maker mm -hmm. on the rig is the company man. Mm -hmm. it's the, and in this case, that's the BP company man. Now, what we're seeing right now within the hearings is this outrageous attempt by BP to point the blame to other people, yeah. to Halliburton or to Transocean. Yeah, I read that the BP are taking 20% of the blame or something like that. I mean, this but is completely outrageous. I mean, obviously, what they're trying to do is mitigate liability, and this is purely to try and protect the stock price. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, this, again, is, is, is corporatism mm -hmm. uh, just out of control. She's talking about languages on the rig. So what has that got to do with this being del okay, so, deliberate? So yeah. basically, um, obviously, everybody on parading on this rig speaks English, mm -hmm. but everybody knows exactly what's required of them. Right. The BP company man is the man, he's the head honcho. Yes. Ultimately, it's him that makes the decisions. Mm -hmm. What we know from the very outset is that Halliburton, who were on the rig to uh, conduct the cementing operation, mm -hmm. to cement the casing in place, yeah. were very uncomfortable with the very unusual situation of the BP company man mm -hmm. challenging their recipe, their design for the uh, cement job. I mean, this just doesn't happen. Right. And what you also have to take into account, Richard, is that um, nobody on this rig was a trainee. Right. Right? This rig was pushing the forefront of drilling and production technology right. in the Western world. You know, 5,000 feet of water, 15,000 feet beneath the seabed. Mm -hmm. And so consequently, you've got very experienced cementers here, and nobody would really question their design. I mean, they would know right. and have taken into account every possible mm -hmm. uh, permutation because right. obviously they wouldn't want any risk. Mm -hmm. But in this case, the BP company man actually told them, and I know what he told them because it's a matter of public record now, he told them not to use the 26 spacers that uh, were in the Halliburton design. And the spacers are very important because that's what keeps the casing in the center of the bore. Right. So in other words, it makes sure that the cement is even all around the casing. If you don't have the spacers, there's the risk that the casing pushes over to one side, and then you've only got, you've got thick cement one side and none right. the other. Right. So we know, because the Halliburton logged this, that the BP company man told them to only use eight spacers. Now, why he would do this is, well, right. it's for the hearings to find out, but they're right. going to have a problem, as we'll talk about in a second. So anyway, Halliburton logged the fact that this was very unusual, mm -hmm. and then my former company, um, after, they've, after Halliburton done the cement job, my former company is employed to do what's called the cement bond log, right. which is the final test of the integrity of the cement. Now, the cement bond log, um, obviously, you're using instrumentation, which is extremely sensitive. And the Schlumberger guys actually realized that the well was kicking, basically, as soon as they started the, uh, the process. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means when the well's kicking, um, it means that basically the cement isn't holding right. and the casing is vibrating. Right. No, I'm exaggerating. I mean, yeah, but yeah, the, case, yeah. the vibration might be microscopic, mm -hmm. but the fact that it's vibrating means that the cement isn't holding. Mm -hmm. You know, it's loose somewhere right, right. and it's only going to get worse. So the Schlumberger guys told the company man that the well was kicking and instructed him to shut down the well. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody would ever think of questioning a very experienced Schlumberger engineer. Because if a Schlumberger engineer tells you that the well is unsafe, mm -hmm. it's unsafe. I mean, there's, you don't second guess. Mm -hmm. You hit the button, you shut the well in. Mm -hmm. The company man mm -hmm. says, well, we're not going to do that. The Schlumberger guys were spooked because, I mean, they'd never come across such an experience like this. All right. So they demanded to be you know, taken, taken off the rig. Taken off the rig because they yeah. thought it might. Exactly. Yeah. Um, anyway, there's two stories here. The official BP story is that the Schlumberger guys left the rig at 11 o'clock on the morning of April the 20th mm -hmm. in a scheduled helicopter mm -hmm. flying back to the Gulf Coast. The Schlumberger, this is the inside story I have from Schlumberger, although right. Schlumberger have closed ranks now, as is everybody. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the inside story is that uh, the Schlumberger guys um, were so spooked, there was no scheduled helicopter, so they phoned their manager in New Orleans and every Schlumberger manager basically has worked on the rig. Yeah. So you know, he, he would know exactly what uh, mm -hmm. the score was when they explained the situation. Mm -hmm. The Schlumberger manager chartered a helicopter, had it flown out to the rig, and took the Schlumberger guys off the rig mm. at 11 o'clock in the morning. Ten hours later, boom, right. the rig blows. We know as a matter of public record that there were phone calls. 
um, where uh, so, you know, somebody on the rig mm -hmm. um, was overheard saying to somebody on the shore, mm -hmm. are you happy now? Mm -hmm. It's on fire. The rig's on fire. Right. And the hearings, of course, need to find out who said right. what. So what does that have to do with language, Ian? Is that... Well, you know, the, there couldn't be any confusion. Sorry. I see what yeah. you're saying. Everybody right. on the rig, everybody, spoke every English. single person on the right. rig spoke fluent right. English. And this is all explained in this, this, this DVD? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, just to um, conclude the story, the individual that uh, I have pointed the finger at mm -hmm. has so far refused to appear at any of the hearings. Mm -hmm. He's pleaded the Fifth Amendment. So what role did this guy play? In? He, he, he was, was he the, the main guy that you. The, he the was a rig? replacement company man. Right, I see. Now there is, a, you know, there is the the questions that need to be asked is why was the most experienced company man in the BP fleet taken off the rig? Who was, by the way, a guy named uh, Ronald Sepulvado. Right. Why was he taken off the rig uh -huh. on April the sixteenth? ostensibly to attend a course mm -hmm. in Lafayette, New Orleans, at the most critical time, mm -hmm. the most critical time of the drilling process. Mm -hmm. and, and why was he replaced with um, a guy who nobody had ever heard of? So was he replaced after this, the, the thing started vibrating? No, 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 he was replaced before. before beforehand, before. right, okay. Yeah, four days before. Four days before. Now, people would might say, well, all right, it sounds fishy, but what on earth would be the reason for somebody deliberately doing something like this, Ian? Okay, well, let's, um, let's go back again to the agenda of those who believe themselves to be the rightful rulers of a planetary fiefdom because they have spelt out in tablets of stone, literally, mm -hmm. their goals and objectives. And this is the Georgia Guidestones mm -hmm. in Elbert County, Georgia, um, where this uh, henge appeared in 1982. Mm -hmm. And in 12, sorry, eight modern languages and eight ancient languages, they have the, the same 10 goals and objectives. And number one is reduce the population to 500 million mm -hmm. in balance with nature. Mm -hmm. And whilst there are many methodologies being used to uh, reduce the population, mm -hmm. um, and they're doing it as subtly as they can, mm -hmm. and actually, although it's not subtle, the reality is that the vast majority of people do not believe that they could ever do something like this. Right. You know, but as Hitler said, mm -hmm. and as Hitler stated in uh, Mein Kampf, he mm -hmm. said, the greater the lie, mm -hmm. you know, basically, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the more likelihood is that You'll the people will it, yeah. never believe that yes. their governments are capable yeah. of perpetrating you know, yes. such an event. So although we've got a whole bunch of other things going on that are also having an impact on the population, this uh, event is going to be a slow burn, but what's right. going to happen is that we're already seeing unexplained, and I'll use the term loosely, mm -hmm. um, unexplained crop damage mm -hmm. at all around the southeastern United States. Well, I would say that there is, my hypothesis is that the crop damage is being caused by toxic rainfall mm -hmm. because the Gulf Stream is not called the Gulf Stream by accident. It's called the Gulf Stream because it emanates from the Gulf of Mexico. Yes. Yeah. And the Gulf of Mexico is the feed source for the tropical storms and the hurricane systems and the weather systems mm -hmm. that uh, come across the Atlantic. Now, it's the southeastern United States and the West Indies and northern Mexico that are going to feel the brunt of this mm -hmm. um, because, obviously, they're closest to, mm -hmm. uh, to the event. And that's why we're seeing uh, and we're getting reports of people who live in, like, Florida... Mm -hmm. And uh, they're getting sick when they go into their swimming pool. Right. And the swimming pools are being found to have um, toxicity to the level of 50 parts per million. Right. I mean, so you think it's possibly part of a depopulation agenda. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, isn't there easier ways? Through, like, for example, through the vaccination program or... Oh, sure, uh, you, you know, but that's happening. They, I mean, obviously, and we know about the swine flu mm -hmm. scam... Listen, these guys will, uh, will go about their goal mm -hmm. on a multi-dimensional basis. Mm -hmm. And of course it's outrageous. Of course it's totally outrageous. Mm -hmm. And of course nobody will ever believe that they would ever do such a thing. Right. And that's where it's so brilliant. Mm -hmm. and, and now, mark my words. Mm -hmm. Mark my words. I mean, you know, we have seen... I, I produced a DVD called The Truth Injection. Mm -hmm. I gave a presentation four days after the outbreak of swine flu in Mexico spelling out the whole of the uh, bird flu, swine flu vaccination scam. Mm. So if anybody in the British government had seen that presentation I gave to the uh, Women's Institute in London um, in April of 2009, I could have saved this country 1.2 billion 
uh, mm -hmm. pounds in vaccines that they wouldn't have needed because they would have seen, and I could have given them the source for my research, and they could have seen it was a scam. You know, this is like all games, right? It's like if, if you go and watch a game of chess, having never seen chess before, mm -hmm. then you don't understand the game. Mm -hmm. But over time, as you start to watch the game or maybe somebody explains how the game's played, mm -hmm. not only do you start to understand the game, but you appreciate the complexities of the game. Mm -hmm. Well, this is like geopolitics. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why for the vast majority of people, unfortunately, they're caught up in the day-to-day Mm -hmm. stuff of life and mm -hmm. kept distracted with soaps and Big Brother and sport, mm -hmm. that they're not looking at what's going on in the mm -hmm. bigger picture. I have the luxury, if you mm -hmm. like, of, of had the luxury of researching this for a number of years. But at, w at what point do you think, because if there is a depopulation agenda, at what point is it going to go bang and everyone's going to go, whoa, they've, they've, they've done it this time. I mean, is there, are we approaching some major event? Do I don't know, think? maybe. I mean, look, if, if my worst case scenario plays out here, mm -hmm. what has been put into action yeah. in the Gulf of Mexico may be absolutely devastating. I mean, this may be an Armageddon type event. Right. Because look, we're already getting the reports of people reporting sick from swimming in their pools. We're getting people reporting sick with the lesions. We're having people reporting sick that they're bleeding out their butt. Just like 9-11, where almost all the first responders are either dead or dying from respiratory illnesses because they were told the air was clear. Mm -hmm. In fact, more people have died in the aftermath of 9-11 than were killed in the, in the Twin Towers. And of course, that's a whole other story as well. But here, what we've got is, is, a, is a, like a slow burn situation mm -hmm. because there is the possibility that literally over the next two or three years, there's the realization that the whole of the southeastern United States is completely and totally uninhabitable as this oil corrects it mix mm -hmm. works its way into the water table. Right. There's also the, um, the risk that this stuff comes across in the Gulf Stream over to Europe. I don't believe it's any accident or any coincidence that the Russians, despite the fact they've had bad weather this year, but I don't believe that there's any coincidence that the Russians have a, a now announced that they will not be exporting any grain either this year or next year. Right. Because the Russians, I think, are ahead of the curve. They've taken a look. They're much more objective, much more open. Mm -hmm. They've taken a look at what's occurring in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. They've taken a look at the evidence, the same evidence I'm looking at, and they're saying, God damn it. You know, mm -hmm. if this stuff comes across in the storm systems into Western Europe and across in the... Um, in the uh, in the sea mm -hmm. then you know we're at risk we lose our fishing you know we're going to lose our our ability to grow crops we're even going to have a contaminated um water table okay then ian well it's a very grave message um are there any is there a silver lining on the cloud at all oh absolutely without any shadow of doubt and what's happening what's been happening over the last um you know decade mm -hmm. and some and, and I'll go back to, you know, the pioneers that you mentioned mm -hmm. um, and who I acknowledged at the start of the program. You know, those guys were right at the forefront trying to wake people up to the pernicious agenda mm -hmm. of those who believe themselves to be the rightful rulers. What's happening with events like 9-11, um, you know, Madrid, the Bali bombs, the London bombs, um, the, the, uh, the Gulf Coast incident, is more and more people are waking up. Mm -hmm. I mean, Zbigniew Brzezinski said uh, in a speech to the Council on Foreign Relations on May the 15th of this year that one of the greatest stumbling blocks to the establishment of a one-world government is the rapid political awakening of the masses. Right. And unfortunately, unfortunately, it may take something even bigger than this, but people are right. waking up, mm -hmm. and I believe that ultimately humanity will prevail. Right. So there's the message. Wake up. Okay, Ian. Thanks very much indeed for coming in. I know you're doing talks. You've got one on uh, later on today, so good luck with that. And I do hope you come back on the Starship again because you've been a fantastic guest. And thanks very much indeed. Thanks, Richard. Are you going to beam me down? <laughs> no, we'll do that after I finish the outro. Okay. okay. So it just remains for me to say, keep your eyes on the skies, keep your feet on the ground, and tell all your friends about this show.